In January 2023, the body of up-and-coming Colombian DJ Valentina Trespalacios was found stuffed inside a blue suitcase that had been shoved inside a trash can on the outskirts of Bogota, Colombia. Early on in the investigation, the police identified their prime suspect, but finding him wouldn't be easy as the Wisconsin-born 35-year-old had already fled the country. Valentina Trespalacios was born on December 16, 2001, to parents Laura Hidalgo and Giovanni Trespalacios. She was one of four siblings who grew up in Bogota with their mother. During her childhood, Valentina's father left the family home and he was not involved in raising them. Her mother took over as the sole provider and did what she could to raise well-rounded individuals. Looking at who Valentina grew into, it was clear she did something right. Daniel, Valentina's older brother, described his sister as very judicious from a young age. Once she left school and started her career as a DJ, Valentina tried to support her family financially. Her ultimate goal was to one day buy her mom a house, the greatest thank you she could offer for raising her. Valentina took her future seriously. She knew what she wanted out of life and was focused on getting it. It was the warrior personality Daniel described that helped her fulfill these goals. Valentina initially planned to work as a model or get a job somewhere in the entertainment industry. However, she knew from an early age that her true passion was in music. She started going to clubs when she was 15 years old, and while on one of these nights out, Valentina met Pablo Silva, a local entrepreneur. He is the one who first mentioned the possibility of becoming a DJ to Valentina. He pushed her to pursue it as a career option, and Valentina didn't need much convincing. Her love of the club scene went hand in hand with DJing, and the idea of becoming a DJ herself seemed like a dream come true. The pair occasionally saw each other out and about, and in 2019, 17-year-old Valentina told Pablo that she had passed a course that meant she was now a certified DJ. He was thrilled to hear the news and offered to work as her manager, telling Valentina about the contacts he had access to in the industry. Before long, Pablo landed Valentina a few gigs at smaller clubs so she could begin gaining more real-life experience and building a reputation for herself. The plan seemed to be working, but after spending this extra time together, the pair realized this was more than a strictly professional relationship. They started seeing each other romantically, and despite the possible conflict of interest, Pablo continued to act as her manager. Over the next few years, Valentina enjoyed serious success in her newfound career. Valentina was cementing herself as one of the serious up-and-coming DJ talents in Colombia, a title that allowed her to travel to some of the best clubs across the country. After three years together, Pablo and Valentina split. He remained her manager, which could lead to the assumption that the separation was amicable. Had it been a toxic situation, working together wouldn't have made much sense. Their business relationship so far had been mutually beneficial, and things were only looking brighter for Valentina in the years to come. She had beaten the odds, growing up in a low-income home with a mother who worked multiple jobs to support her children, to now living the high life, experiencing the glitz and glam that came with being a recognized DJ. Throughout all of this, she kept her promise to her family and continued to support them where she could. With every month that passed, it seemed she was getting closer to that dream of buying her mom a house. Once she had gotten over the breakup with Pablo, Valentina started to think about dating again. She was a young, beautiful, interesting girl with a unique job. Valentina wasn't the type of person who found it difficult to meet and make connections with people. She downloaded Tinder and started swiping to see if anyone caught her eye. It turned out that one man did. John Poulos was 34 years old when he first met Valentina. The Wisconsin-born man was still based in the United States, but this didn't stop him and Valentina from striking up a conversation. They seemed to hit it off right away, and after messaging back and forth for a few days, they decided it was worth meeting in person. Instead of John going all the way to Colombia, they settled in Mexico. Valentina had been asked to attend a music festival being hosted there, 
and it made sense that they would meet somewhere in the middle of their home countries. When they met, the connection they felt online continued in person. Neither the 13-year age gap nor the language barrier stopped them from deciding they wanted to pursue things further. John was enamored with not only Valentina's beauty, but her intelligence and talent. She wasn't just a pretty face, and her dedication to her career was admirable. Not wanting to leave after the weekend, the pair ended up staying for an additional two days in Mexico, where they continued to get to know each other. But there were things about John that Valentina would never find out. Things that, had she known, she may have never even considered entering into a relationship with him. John had married a woman called Ashley in 2009, and the pair had three children together. Their marriage was nothing unusual, though Ashley noted John had always been quick to anger. However, when one of their children was diagnosed with cancer, that side of him became far more severe. Ashley felt like the stress sparked a change in him, and John never went back to how he had been before. Ashley tried to deal with his behavior for years before she eventually had enough. When she filed for divorce, she saw another, even worse side of John. A side that showed not an ounce of care for the mother of his children or the children themselves. Before the divorce was finalized, John moved all of their assets to an offshore account, making it impossible for Ashley to access any of the wealth she had built with John during this marriage. He also refused to pay her any child support. Instead, he chose to spend his money on sending gifts to Valentina, who had no idea that John had children. The pair often went on vacation together, and John would travel to Colombia to see Valentina whenever he had a chance. After a few months, Valentina introduced him to her family, and they all seemed to love him. He seemed like a nice person, Daniel, Valentina's brother, recalled. He took my mother and my two little brothers to eat once at a restaurant in a very good neighborhood in Bogota, and he appeared to be a good man. He promised my sister that he would come back to get married. Valentina's mother, Laura Hidalgo, thought John was a good man and the type of person who could look after her daughter. She saw the holidays they took together and was charmed by John whenever he visited. Laura also saw how much Valentina loved John. From her end, she really did see a future with him. Over the 10-10 month span that they were together, Valentina's career progression didn't slow. Even though she was in the honeymoon phase of this new and exciting relationship, she hadn't lost focus on where her passion lay. John watched on as Valentina continued to gain more fame, and with this fame, naturally, came more attention. But John wanted Valentina all to himself, and didn't like the fact that she interacted with males while at clubs working. He grew increasingly suspicious of her cheating, and even though she had not been unfaithful, John hired a private investigator to follow Valentina and see if he could catch her with someone. This came after he had already proposed to her and was telling Valentina she could start planning the wedding. It was as if John saw this proposal of some sort of ownership over Valentina. She was his, and he wanted to control every aspect of her life, including who she was, friends with, and what she did on social media. With his controlling behavior escalating, John made Valentina video call him at each event she was DJing at. Since he was not in Colombia, he needed to find other ways to watch her every move, and if Valentina spoke to another man, she would have to deal with John and his anger issues. Valentina's family heard about John's possessive behavior, but they believed this was nothing more than jealousy from a man who was madly in love with a younger woman. Valentina herself, however, grew tired of John's controlling nature, and by December 2022, they were arguing almost every day. Still, John had a trip planned to come and visit Valentina in January, and he still told her he wanted to get married and spoke of finding an apartment together. He said he'd come to get married, that he was going to buy an apartment, and well, all that was a lie, Daniel explained. He told my sister they would only stay there for one or two months while they looked to buy an apartment. But now we know from the investigators that wasn't so. He had also rented a car for only the same three days, Friday, 
Saturday, and Sunday. John arrived in Columbia and picked up his rental car before driving to Valentina's family home to pick her up and take her to the Airbnb he had rented for them. That night, they went out to several clubs that Valentina often worked at, and according to witnesses, everything seemed fine between the pair. They had a few drinks together, and it looked like they were catching up after some time apart. The next day, John started helping Valentina move her things into an apartment he rented for them. While she was there, she FaceTimed her family to give them a little tour of the place. The last contact any of Valentina's family had with her was when her 13-year-old brother video called her. At 11 p.m. on Saturday, they had a video call until midnight. Then nothing is known until 2 p.m. on Sunday, Daniel said. It was January 23rd. That day had gone by as usual for Valentina's family members, each of them unaware of the news that would come in later that evening. At 7.45, Laura received a phone call from Pablo. What he said left her in complete disbelief. Valentina had been found dead early that day. A homeless man had been rummaging through trash cans when he came across a suitcase. He tried to pull it out, but found the bag was excessively heavy. He tried a few more times to get the luggage out, hoping something valuable would be inside. But slowly, an uneasy feeling started to settle over him. The homeless man noticed tape had been repeatedly wrapped around the suitcase. When he tore the tape, he found a white plastic bag inside the suitcase with visible bloodstains leaking through. The man stopped touching the luggage right away, not wanting to implicate himself in whatever was going on. Instead, he alerted the authorities, who arrived on the scene shortly after. They cordoned off the scene and had a forensic officer open the bag. Inside was the body of a young woman. Inside the dumpster, the investigators found a small black purse, which revealed Valentina's ID. This allowed the authorities to quickly identify who they had just found. Valentina had been strangled to death. She was covered in bruises, and it was clear she had suffered a great deal at the hands of her attacker. When Valentina's family found out how she had died, they were left to imagine the horror of her final moments. The more we know, the worse it is because my sister's last moments were very hard, Daniel said. Imagine it. She's skinny, but she's tall, and that suitcase is super small. Alongside Valentina's ID, the investigators found her cell phone. It still had power, and when they looked at the screen, dozens of calls from Pablo came up. When they spoke with Pablo and told him the news, he explained that Valentina hadn't spoken with him in over 24 hours, which was incredibly unusual for her. But there was an incredibly important piece of information that Pablo had for the authorities. He had a name for them, telling them they needed to look into John Poulos. Laura was able to give the investigators the address of where Valentina had been staying with John, and when they traveled there, the investigators found a modern apartment building equipped with a multitude of surveillance cameras. First, the surveillance footage catches John entering the apartment alone. With him is a large blue suitcase, one that looks very similar to the suitcase Valentina was later found in. He then left the apartment to pick up Valentina. A few hours go by, and Valentina can be seen at the apartment with John. She has a significant amount of personal items with her, further proving her family's story that Valentina thought she was moving in with John. Over the next day, the pair can be seen coming and going from the apartment. While they were out at the clubs, they were seen together. When they returned home in the early morning hours of January 22nd, Valentina could be seen entering the apartment, followed by John. However, she is not seen leaving. In fact, that was the last time Valentina was seen alive again. After a few hours, John emerges. He had the blue suitcase with him this time, which was noticeably heavier than before. The cameras caught John in the underground parking, loading the suitcase into the back of his rental car. He looks around to make sure no one is around before lifting the weighty bag and placing it in the boot. The investigators then followed the car right to the area where Valentina's body had been found. By now, the news of Valentina's murder had made headlines across the country. John's face was being published across all major news sites as the authorities had officially identified him 
as their prime suspect. Much to their horror, however, no one was going to find John in Colombia. Shortly after the murder, he had boarded a flight to Panama. The investigators working on Valentina's case placed a desperate call to the officials at Panama's Tocumen International Airport and found out John had booked a flight to Sao Paulo, Brazil. But that wasn't the only flight John had booked. In an effort to throw investigators off, he had booked two separate flights, with the second destination being Istanbul. John had his sights set on getting to Istanbul, but while he waited to board, armed authorities stormed the gate and arrested him before he could flee. Had this happened just an hour later, John would have already been taking off. But why Istanbul? Once he arrived, John hoped to travel to Montenegro since the country doesn't have an extradition process with Colombia. He was intent on getting away with murdering Valentina. Unfortunately for him, the authorities had been too close the whole time. A day after his arrest, John was extradited back to Colombia from Panama. He was charged with femicide, which is the killing of a woman or girl, in particular by a man and on account of her gender. In Colombia, femicide carries a minimum sentence of 40 years behind bars. John's defense team made repeated attempts to delay the trial, with their biggest complaint being the language barrier stopping John from fully understanding the proceedings. In April 2023, his trial was scheduled to begin, but the defense claimed John didn't have access to a suitable translator while in custody. They even tried to argue against the femicide charge, saying that, since it does not exist in the United States, Joan was not aware of the implications. Clearly, the defense was just doing their job as this claim was a bizarre one. The defense's claims did delay the trial by a few months. All the while, he and his team continued to do everything they could to create further delays, even claiming that Valentina had walked out of the apartment after an argument and John never saw her again. How they thought this argument would work when surveillance footage proved otherwise is unclear. In September 2023, John attended a hearing and once again claimed he was innocent. He refused to accept the charges laid against him. In reality, the mother, the friend, the club owner, the ex-boyfriend, they are all lying, he said. Colombia has decided to deny my rights. For example, my capture was completely illegal and there is a list of things and ways in which Colombia has denied my rights, but one of the biggest is that I have not been allowed to present my evidence. The following month in October, John fired his entire legal team once again, trying to put off the inevitable trial that awaited him. In December 2023, his trial began. It continued in January 2024, with John testifying before the court about his relationship with Valentina. Yes, I was in love with Valentina. When we met for the first time, she seemed that she had a very good energy, John said. We had a great time together, and over time, as we got to know each other more, I realized that we had very different lives. But it seemed like we matched together very well. And yes, I was in love with her. He claimed that after they woke up late on the morning of January 21st, he and Valentina consumed a mixture of drugs and alcohol inside the apartment. After that, John says all he can remember is staying in bed and sleeping. We had a good time that night. So here we are, the next day, partying again. It was a lot of partying in a short time, and from then on, I don't remember exactly what happened. We both fell asleep. That's the last thing I remember. The prosecution believes something entirely different unfolded and they have the evidence to back it up. They allege that Valentina's murder had been a calculated attack from John, as exhibited by him only paying for three days in that apartment, even though he told Valentina they would be staying there for a few months. The surveillance footage spoke for itself as well, and the fact that he fled the country hours after driving to the, the same location where Valentina's body had been dumped all pointed to him being guilty. For now, we have to wait and see what verdict will come of the trial. Some sources suggest John has been awarded a new trial, but state that it will take place in February of this year. 
There is little room for doubt that John Poulos is guilty of murdering Valentina Trespalacios, taking away a young woman who had so much to live for, a young woman who was supporting her family, someone who had a lifetime of dreams left to accomplish. If there is any justice, he will be sentenced to spend the rest of his natural life behind bars. The case ends here. Thanks for watching.